Let's introduce our fine cast of folks here for this morning's broadcast. Hello, everyone. And thank you so much for tuning in. My name is Patrick. I'm the one here in the middle with the worms here in the background. And as you can see in this fantastic screen, we have a host of folks that are going to be joining us here for this morning's chat all about the wonderful world of worms. If I can get this correct, I'm going to point... This way is Mr. George Matsumoto. You'll be able to see him answering questions over on uh, Facebook uh, and other locations over here, there, this way. We have uh, Susan uh, Von Thun, who is uh, uh, running social media there for the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute social media feeds alongside Cassie, who's below uh, Susan there. Uh, and then directly below me is our special guest, Shannon uh, Johnson, who's going to talk about worms. And then we've got uh, finally in the Brady Bunch down here, we've got Emily, the other half of the Monterey Bay Aquarium social media team. Let's say hello to everybody there at home. Hi, everybody. Hello. Thanks so Hi. much. Thanks, Thanks so much for tuning in, everyone. Yeah, thank you for being there. Uh, Shannon, I'm going to uh, go to you here very quickly because you are going to be uh, leading us on a fantastic journey here into the wonderful world of worms. Can you introduce yourselves to the folks there at home? Uh, let them know uh, what your specialty is and what we're going to be talking about today. Sure. My name is Shannon Johnson, and I'm a research technician at the Monterey Bay Aquarium. And um, my specialty is I do population genetics on deep sea animals. And so I either work on, most of my career I've worked on worms and clams and snails. And now I work on critters in the midwater, gene fours and things. So anything with DNA basically. That's awesome. And uh, I'm going to put you up here with some deep sea uh, vent worms there in the background, uh, because that is what we are going to be talking about today. In fact, I'll, uh, I'll get rid here of, uh, of the of our logos introducing you you were a, an angler fish there just for a little bit but behind you right now shannon we've got you on a backdrop of some, a hydrothermal vent with some tube worms there we're going to be talking about that here uh in just a, a little bit can you give us just a quick intro into these uh, wonderful worms that you have there not only as your zoom background but also uh also there on screen behind you all right these guys are some of the coolest beasts in the ocean they are two worms that live on the sides of hydrothermal vents. And so these worms are bestimentiferans and they have completely lost their ability to eat by themselves. They've lost their mouths, they've lost um, their stomachs, and then most importantly, they've lost their butts. So um, <laughs> <laughs> they, instead of actually themselves eating, they use symbiotic bacteria inside of the structure called a trophosome inside of their belly. Well, what would be their belly is just full of bacteria. And um, so they use the bacteria. The bacteria eat the minerals basically coming out of the hydrothermal vents and then feed the worms. The worms take up oxygen and um, the minerals out of the vents and feed that back to the bacteria. So it's a nice symbiosis. But the coolest thing about some of these worms um, the, the big ones you see, they actually are big. There's a lot of stuff we see in the deep sea that's kind of small and we collect it and it looks massive when we collect it and then we get it up to the surface and we're like, oh, it's tiny, where is it? <laughs> These worms can be like four feet tall. And I had a great picture of one of our interns um, out at sea with us one year and she was dissecting one of these and she was a very tall, skinny, beautiful ballerina girl and the worm looked just like the same her tall, skinny and beautiful. <laughs> wow, that's awesome. Uh, can you describe to us again what you meant when they've lost their butts? Uh, let's just get that <laughs> out of the way here. I'm sure, Emily, that was probably one of the main questions that people uh, were probably having there at home, or at least <laughs> if I was everyone at home, I'm just going to say that that's the one that I'm most interested in, right? So um, <laughs> can you tell us a little bit more? Uh, oh, I've spotlighted the video for myself. Hey, uh, so my question to you, Shannon, just to get us going, before we introduce Mbari completely, let's get the first big fact there out there to the world. Shannon, you said that they lost their butts. Tell me about that. Well, if you're not eating food and excreting um, poop, you don't really need to poop, right? And so the bacteria take care of that part, I believe. And um, the worms can diffuse waste products across their membranes or whatever. So they no longer need to poop because they're not actually eating. So no pooping. Okay. Well, I'm just going to go back to a gallery view of all of us there just to gauge the reaction. How do we all feel about that generally? 
<laughs> pretty good. I'd say after about 20 minutes of technical difficulties getting the stream started, I feel a whole lot better about this about this whole thing. Um, I, mean, I don't I don't want to ruin that feeling, Patrick, but uh, it looks like we are not live on Facebook, but that's OK. We're just going to roll with this. You know what? <laughs> if we're not live on Facebook, uh, <laughs> That's because I forgot to hit a button. And you know what? For This means that for everybody else who's watching on all of the other platforms. They got secret butt worms. <laughs> they, got, they got secret butt. They got, yeah. So um, for everybody who's watching on Twitch, on Periscope, on Twitter, uh, on YouTube, you got some content that Facebook uh, did not get here uh, in that particular um, in that particular moment. So, you know what, let's just reset. You know, I think that that really helped Shannon. I, let's just reset. We'll, we'll go to, uh, the original introduction while I hit, uh, go live here. So everybody who's watching, this is a live production. Uh, we're all in our respective homes during the shelter in place. So, um, I'm just going to reset. I'm going to throw the cover back up here. I'm going to hit go live on Facebook and we're just going to go directly into mysteries of the deep one more time. How's everybody feel about that? Sounds good. Patrick. Sounds good. Let's do it. Okay. All Let's right. Do it. Let's do it. Okay. It's a weird Man. Monday, not Monday. <laughs> yep. Let's do Hi, this. everybody. Welcome. Okay. Let's give this a shot. All righty. Well, hey, re good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Monterey Bay Aquarium and the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute's social media feeds. If you are joining us right now on Facebook, welcome. Thank you so much for being there. And if you folks are uh, tuning in on the rest of the social media platforms, uh, my name is Patrick. I'll put everybody up here on screen that you might be uh, seeing. Um, did we lose Shannon in this? Uh, we may have lost Shannon. This is awesome. Oh, no. Uh, well, hey, you know what? I'm just going to put us back up here on screen. Hey, everybody. My name is Patrick. I'm right here in the middle uh, reintroducing everybody. Uh, we've got the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research In Institute, or Mbari, surrounding us here. We've got uh, uh, George over here uh, on my uh, left side of the screen. We've got Susan on the right side of the screen. We've got Cassie down below. They are part of the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, located about 20 miles north of here, uh, uh, outside of the Moss Landing area. And then right below me down here is Emily, the other half of the Monterey Bay Aquarium social media team. You know Emily. Uh, we had a deep sea uh, researcher in Shannon uh, who was here with us moments ago talking about uh, wonderful worms here. Uh, it appears that we've lost Shannon while we are live. Uh, we'll see if we can get her back. Um, Susan or Cassie, we'll, we'll, be, we'll be working on that while George answers your questions. But maybe what I'll go to right now is just... <laughs> The surprise interview with George now. <laughs> yeah, uh, George, you're on now. No, uh, okay. Well, here, I'll switch over here, everybody. So uh, today we were going to be talking about some deep sea worms. Uh, worms are weird and wonderful and a key part of the ecosystem uh, from the sea surface down to the sea floor. And here we have some hydrothermal vent uh, worms. Hydrothermal uh, being vents where you've got a lot of hot water that's chock full of uh, wonderful chemistry coming there out of the crust um, or the seafloor there uh, from beneath the crust of the earth. And in that is a whole bunch of life for, uh, for different organisms or life can use that chemo, the chemistry that's in there in something called chemosynthesis. You may have heard of photosynthesis where uh, basically organisms are eating the sun, creating energy out of that sunlight. Well, here we've got some bacteria that are able to make energy out of breaking up some of those chemical compounds there. And if you're able to make some energy out of that, then you can start a food chain there. And so what we were talking about with Shannon a little bit earlier is we've got these giant vent worms uh, that have the um, their guts filled with these bacteria that are digesting that chemistry. And all along the deep sea floor are different types of chemosynthesis, different types of chemosynthetic communities. We're at the core. You've got those bacteria that are digesting uh, that chemistry instead of feeding themselves from the sun like we know with photosynthesis. Uh, looks like we've got Shannon coming back here on. We'll have her here in a second. Um, but so this research is being done here at the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute. I'll refer to it as Mbari going forward. Mbari is located about 20 miles north of the aquarium at uh, in Moss Landing there at the head of the Monterey Submarine Canyon. 
the submarine canyon in Monterey is essentially like having the Grand Canyon underwater. It goes down about a mile deep from rim to the depth of the canyon, and you stack another mile of water up above it. So about two miles deep there at its deepest point. And so that means the deep sea is far more accessible here than in other locations around the world. We can actually head out for the day to go and see what's happening in the deep sea. And then the researchers can come back and have some dinner, tuck in the kids. That's a very unique situation. Here is the Rachel Carson, one of the uh, one of Mbari's many vessels. Here is the RV Western Flyer. And aboard these vessels are really, really amazing instruments known as ROVs, or remotely operated vehicles. This one here is the Ventana, our window into the deep sea. Here is the ROV Doc Ricketts that's aboard the Western Flyer, as Ed Ricketts was aboard the Western Flyer himself. And these ROVs are piloted by um, the pilots back up on the surface there so there's no one on board these vessels which means they can stay down a lot longer uh, and do a lot of cool stuff uh, repeatedly whereas um, people might tire themselves out doing as much work as these robots do and aboard these ROVs critically are HD cameras uh, really really amazing cameras that's how we're getting all of this video footage that's how I'm playing all of these video clips is from uh, those ROV cameras. And again, back up on board the ship is where the pilots are, where the researchers are, where Shannon uh, might be hanging out there uh, looking at those worms. And so now if I can figure out how to do so seamlessly, we're going to put Shannon back up on screen. Welcome, Shannon. We're live. Hey, we're live everywhere now. We're live on Facebook. We're live on YouTube. Uh, people got a couple of different intros. But hey, Shannon, welcome back. Thanks so much for being Thank there. You. I'm glad to be back. Yeah, can you uh, reintroduce yourself for the folks that are that are tuning in over on on Facebook? Uh, can you tell us uh, what is your job at uh, Anambari and what are we going to be talking about today? Okay, um, again, I'm Shannon Johnson and I'm a research technician at Ambari. And so my job is I use genetics to understand how different populations of animals are connected. And I can work on worms, clams, snails, anything with DNA. Now I work on tinafores. And so, you know, I have a cool job and they pay me to do science. So, yay. That's awesome. So I've got you uh, right now picture in picture th there with some of those worms there in the background. You did mention tinafores. I'll just put those up very quickly for those of you wondering. Tinafores are comb jellies. I've got uh, a loctina up there on screen. Um, can you tell us uh, just a few couple fun things you like about comb jellies before we dive into the world of worms? Ah, comb jellies are really cool. They're um, they're really interesting. Lucky for me, they have small genomes, so that makes them easier to look at population genomics with because there's less DNA to sequence. Um, but they're also really beautiful. You know, I've spent a lot of my career trying to get people excited about worms and snails. And, you know, I, I say this a lot, you know, people are not usually that stoked on worms. They're, they, because, you know, when you see a worm you think about like the earthworms that you see crawling around in your garden and they're basically like a sleeve of tissue and that's about it but the worms I get to work on are these big beautiful giant interesting chemosynthetic worms but tinafores do not take a lot of convincing to tell people they're cool and so then I'm like on the other end of the spectrum like I don't just work on them because they're pretty I work on them because they're interesting too right yeah and I've got bloody belly comb jelly there in the background while you're mentioning worms I had a little uh, green bomber worm going by, but let's dive down here back to those vent community uh, tube worms because um, something that the Facebook folks are not familiar with uh, that we had um, known on the other channels. These tube worms here in the background, I talked a little bit about chemosynthesis, talked a little bit about how they're making their energy from breaking up some chemistry coming out of the Earth's crust and not from eating the sun like we might uh, be accustomed to. But can you tell us a little bit about the surprising digestive tract of these worms and explaining a little bit more about the chemosynthesis because we don't want the folks at home to uh, be left without this particular fact. Right, okay, so most of the worms that, especially the worms that live on hydrothermal vents and hydrocarbon seeps, they're really highly evolved. They, do, they don't eat anymore. They've lost their mouths, they've lost their guts, and they've lost their butts. <laughs> so they don't poop. 
Um, <laughs> they actually, instead of a gut inside of them, they have this bag called a trophosome and it's just packed full of bacteria. And the bacteria are the ones that are digesting the minerals that, that um, worms take up from the hydrothermal vents or the hydrocarbon seeps. And so, um, yeah, they don't poop. There's no pooping. They excrete weight, but in a much different way than we do. There we go. So uh, these are worms without butts there. So that's very exciting. I'm bringing the rest of us up here uh, on screen just to transition back. Uh, Emily, do we have any questions already for Shannon? I can't imagine we've mentioned anything here uh, so far that, <laughs> pe that people would want to know. But uh, Emily, you're up here on screen. Uh, what do the folks want to know there at home? Yeah, so I think the major question that we're getting right now is just how big are the worms that we're looking at are? Right, so the giant tube worms that you see on the vents are actually quite large. They can be over and long, which is over three feet long, right? And like, I have this great picture. I told this a little bit earlier, but I'm gonna tell it again because it's such a cute story. Our intern, who's this really tall, skinny, beautiful ballerina girl, was dissecting Riftia when we were at sea in the Gulf of California. And she was holding up the Riftia right next door. And it was almost as tall and long and skinny and pretty as she is. Wow. But some of the other worms, they can be, but and then the Riftia are pretty wide in diameter. Some of the other worms, um, they're really, really, really long and skinny and really, really hard to get out of the tubes without destroying them um, because these guys are all tube worms. But uh, they can be really, really, really like meters long and but um, the Rifty are the really are our poster children for big, beautiful vent worms. That's excellent. Um, putting those back up there on screen. Uh, are there any more uh, questions, Emily, right now for, for Shannon? Otherwise, we can talk about some, some other uh, worms that uh, we'll be talking a lot about at the aquarium and have already talked a lot about um, the ones that live on whale bones. But uh, Emily, before we go to that, what, uh, what are the folks wanting to know out there? Uh, yeah, Patrick. So a lot of folks wondering where exactly these videos are coming from that we're taking a look at now. Okay, so yeah. most we don't have any hydro Monterey Bay. We wish we did, but you know we really we really have to go to these distant places like the Gulf of California, or I got to go to Easter Island one year. Vents are located on mid-ocean spreading centers. So they're basically underwater volcanoes that um, are created in thin spots of the Earth's crust. And, you know, um, tectonically, our thin spots in the Earth's crust are much closer to land. Um, the San Andreas Fault would be a good example. Um, when the San Andreas Fault goes offshore, up off the coast of Oregon, it creates hydrothermal vents. And there's a lot of really cool um, vent sites down up there and also down off um, the coast of Mexico, all the way down to off the coast of Chile is the entire East Pacific rise. So, you know, we have to travel really far to beautiful places to work on this stuff. It sounds like sounds a difficult, so terrible. Yeah, I mean, the struggle is real, right? But that's what you get for uh, that's what you get for being interested in worms, where other people might not be so interested. It turns out, jokes on them. If you're into worms, you have to travel to cool places, go find them, huh? Exactly. Exactly. All right, um, Patrick. We had a couple more questions coming in there. Um, yes. Two really great ones, Shannon. If you're you're ready to answer a double question here, is why are they so red? And what are all those little crabs doing with them? Okay, they're red. Those are their plumes. And that's where they take up um, all, they do all their gas exchange. So they take up all the oxygen out of the water and deliver it down to themselves and their bacteria to keep their huge colony of bacteria alive. And they're red because they're super highly oxygenated. Um, and they have lots of hemoglobin. The crabs are trying to eat them. <laughs> they're not very nice. And um, what's kind of cool is you can see the little zoarcid fishes swimming in and out of the colony. And they, I don't, the, zo the zoarcids, they're almost like an anemone, anemone, um, where the clownfish and the anemone are symbiotic. I have always had a hard time saying that word. Um, but the crabs are not, they're trying to eat them. They're not nice. All right. Well, that's that's good to know. Uh, let's see. Let's put us uh, the rest of us back up here on screen just to transition over uh, just so we can see me here. Hey, uh, so we're going to head over now to another type of uh, chemosynthetic uh, synthetic 
community that you folks may have heard about, and those are the ones that we find on whale carcasses. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, what we're seeing here? We've got a gray whale carcass up on screen. Oh, okay. Um, so the there's a totally different group of worms that get to live in this environment, and uh, so but they're closely related to they're in the the group of Vestimentiferans. In fact, when they first discovered Vestimentiferans, they got their whole own phylum of animals. But it turns out they're just worms. Um, but the Ocidax are, are these bone eating worms that live on the bones. They actually consume the bones of the whales. And they also have no butts. Um, they have no mouths and they are completely reliant on a different type of symbiotic bacteria. And these symbiotic bacteria are breaking down the nutrients that come out of the bones of the whales. There we go. And so um, these plumes that are sticking up out of the out of the um, the bone right now, those belong to the females, is my understanding, correct? Well, yes. Okay, so um, we've We've found about 30 different species of these bone eating worms called Ocidax, os for bone, dax for eating, um, just in the Monterey Bay alone. People have discovered them all over the world. And when we first found them, all we could ever find, and when I say we, I mean the um, brilliant taxonomist Greg Rouse, who acts at the morphology of the worms. Some of us just sequence them. Um, <laughs> when we were looking at them, uh, Greg, um, he can't find any males. Every worm he found was female. And we know lots of different animals like worms do um, weird things sex-wise where they can be hermaphrodites or um, have um, different sized genders um, just to, to stay alive and um, evolutionarily. So he looked and looked and he finally found males and they're tiny little sperm donors that live in the tubes of the females. They, um, they are not parasitic and the older the females are and the bigger they are, the more worm or the more males they acquire. So it's kind of like our awesome girl power story where the, <laughs> the females have won the balance. The females get to be the big, beautiful worms and the males are just the little sperm donors. Um, they totally live off their yolk reserves. Um, but we did find one species that um, do produce big males. And of course, Greg, you know, he's a guy and he's been working on all these female worms for a lot of his career. And he got very excited when he finally found the big males. And so they named it after the god of fertility, Ocidax Priapus. All right. So uh, bone-eating worms, feminist icon, maybe not something most people were expecting from, uh, from a, worm, uh, a worm live stream, but there it is. <laughs> there we are. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, so and um, I'm just showing some more uh, whale fall footage here. A whale fall, for the folks out there who might be interested, is when uh, a whale dies. It's many, sometimes hundreds of tons that is sinking out to the deep sea and becomes a feast for many animals. Right now we've got uh, loads of amphipods and hagfish that are chowing down on this whale carcass. Whale falls are a big, uh, big part of the deep sea uh, community out here. If um, orcas are killing gray whale calves as they, as they tend to, then they end up sinking out uh, into the deep. And so then you end up having all of these animals that are coming by uh, feasting on, on, those, on those bones there. So in case you hear that term whale fall, so right here you can see a bunch of snails eating uh, there on the whale. So that is another type of chemosynthetic uh, community when the, or when the, um, the worms are eating their way inside of the, the bone, right? Is that, is that a correct way of understanding um, that community there, Shannon? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Okay. It's a it's a boon to the deep sea because you know not a lot of the ocean has a lot of food to eat everywhere. So when a whale falls and dies, um, there's a huge amount of food. Oh, and you guys showed the bone eating snails too. So oh yeah, um, I can put those back up here. Here, let's put those back. Up here now. <laughs> the um, these are actually. Um, these guys actually also maybe we haven't quite figured out how they're eating the bone, but when we opened up the gut of these snails, they had um, only bones and stones like um, from the ground, like a bird would use like a crop to like degree. Well, it looks like maybe we've lost Shannon oh, no. over just the 
the strength of how uh of how strong hey everybody i'm patrick there looks like we we may have lost shannon there over the over the connection uh you know you can't talk about too many bone eating snails before the internet just doesn't allow that uh to that discussion to proceed so um let's see i'll put uh emily up here on screen emily what kind of questions uh do we have out there and then we'll see if we can get shannon back otherwise we'll uh, go to our ambari colleagues uh emily what do the folks want to know about the worms that broke the internet <laughs> the worms that broke the internet <laughs> yes um, well, this is kind of a, a topical question, especially for people who are uh, local to our area, Patrick. Um, they've heard about a lot of gray whales washing up on beaches, and specifically someone heard that there was a gray whale that washed up on a beach in Santa Cruz that uh -huh. might become part of this whole science and research that we're talking about right now. Absolutely. I can take that question real quick. Uh, yeah, so for the folks out there who may have heard about that whale uh, over in Santa Cruz, uh, the, um, the aquarium is working on doing some, uh, some bone worm observation uh, and some culturing for potential exhibition at the aquarium. And so working with uh, many other researchers, uh, that gray whale is likely going to become a part of a scientific experiment out there in the deep sea to see how um, those bone-eating worms are going to progress. So uh, yes, you may have heard of a couple of different gray whales that have washed up uh, recently. I believe that one was a young adult, but we have had a few calves here uh, in the area that have... Um, that have been preyed upon by uh, by orcas that have been in the area too. So um, it's a natural part of the of the life cycle here in uh, in the Monterey Bay for there to be those orcas hunting the gray whales. And actually, when the aquarium does reopen and you come and visit us uh, again, you'll be able to see in our rafters we have the orcas and we have the gray whale sculptures, and that's actually a diorama showing you the drama that can happen in the bay of those uh, large predatory. Um, predatory whales of the the killer whales the orcas going after um, the gray whale calves that are migrating currently um, up from Mexico and Baja which we mentioned the tube worms there so they're traveling right over those tube worms uh, as they go um, on their way up to uh, north of Alaska to go feed before they come back down so now is actually prime time for orcas in in the area and that bought us enough time to be able to bring Shannon back up on screen. Shannon, you're back. Woo! We did it. Sorry, guys. <laughs> hey, no worries. You know, I think uh, everybody right now is graduating uh, from Zoom University uh, everywhere. So there's there's all of us there. I'm sure this is a very familiar uh, place for everyone uh, to be in and the frustrations of, of teleconferencing. Uh, uh, present here on the stream. This is basically as organic of a live stream as you could possibly get talking about chemosynthetic communities beyond actually holding the worms in your hand there, Shannon. That's what I'm thinking. Okay. Agreed. All right. <laughs> well, I think I think that was a, a proper a proper go at a transition. Uh, Emily, do we have any other questions? Uh, no, oh. Shannon is back. <laughs> We have a lot of questions that have come in for you, Shannon. Uh, so I hope that you're ready. I'm going to start with the most pressing one. Um, people are wondering, do any worms have butts? Or is this a <laughs> classification of these specific worms? That people want to know. Well, this is, we're a little out of my um, area of expertise. But as far as I know, all the vestimentiferans only don't have butts, no butts. The rest of the worms, I believe, have butts because they don't necessarily use chemosynthetic bacteria to feed. So just the besties. There you go. Okay. There you go. <laughs> now, uh, Shannon, I have here a few other uh, types of worms I'm just going to put up right now behind you. I've got a cold seep tube worm here. Uh, lamella brachia there behind you now. Um, you were mentioning different types of chemosynthetic communities. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about cold seeps uh, in the Monterey Bay? Right on. So we, yeah, so we do, we are lucky enough to have cold seeps in the Monterey Bay, and there's a few different species of vestimentiferans that live here. Um, there's melobrachia, and, um, and there's a couple different species of melobrachia, and these are cool. They can live at vents or seeps, different species, um, and they're also vestimentiferans, again, no buts, and instead of um, extracting minerals from a hydrothermal vent, they have really, really long um, posteriors, not butts, they are acting differently than butts where they extend their, I don't know, the end, not their head, they're not head, their butt <laughs> into the sediment 
to extract stuff um, and minerals that are coming really slowly leaking out of the bottom of the ocean instead of it, the big hot hydrothermal vent, it's, we call it a cold seep or hydrocarbon seep. Um, and then an interesting fact about these worms is their relatives from the Gulf of Mexico have been estimated to live up to 300 years long. So Whoa. they're really long lived species. And, and that's really in contrast to the vent um, worms that are closely related to them, but um, but the vent worms, vents can blink on and off in a matter of decades, and so the hydrocarbon seeps are a much can be a much more stable environment. So it can they can persist for a really long time, which is super cool. All right, thank you so much uh, for that. I can go to uh, Emily here. What kind of questions do the folks have out there about the worms? But by, by the way, right now we've got a really amazing group of worms with uh, with snails on top of them and crabs and everything uh, and going by there. So a mess of tangle of, of worms there. But let's see, Emily, you're well, back up on screen. What's going on? Well, no, that's a great tie in to one of the questions that we had there, Patrick. Um, folks are curious, how do the worms and snails find these whales in between uh, meals there? How do they travel to find them? And, uh, you know, what determines if a whale might sink or if it's going to wash ashore? Such a good question, because we don't actually know. Um, we So the Ocidax are have a lot of babies, a lot, a lot of babies. And we think that they drift along in the currents until they get some sort of chemical cue when the whale is rotted enough and but enough tissue is stripped away. And in fact, most whales do end up on the beach. So we had one last week here in Santa Cruz where um, a whale died and it washed up on the beach and then they rot, rot, rot. And then a big storm usually drags them back offshore and they've rotted enough um, where their bellies blow up with all this really smelly gas. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, it smells really bad. And um, unless we're there to ventilate them ourselves, which I've had the privilege of doing, <laughs> um, <laughs> it takes a while for them to sink. And so they usually, sharks and different critters will come and feed on them and then they eventually do sink. But yeah, they do sometimes, a lot of times, spend some quality time on the beach. In fact, we had one on Pebble Beach on Easter weekend and they called us and they were like, we have a crisis. There's a dead whale on our beach. <laughs> and we, so we sunk it for them and it's good. It was a really amazing steady site, but it was pretty funny that that was like the big crisis. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, I mean, the, the smelly flensing of a, of a bloated, uh, decomposing whale is certainly, um, crisis enough for anyone's nostrils within a few miles of, of that. But very excited for the gulls and raccoons and other animals and probably some folks' dogs walking around wanting to go roll around in it, I'm sure. Oh, yeah. <laughs> very cool. All right, uh, Emily, back to you. Uh, what uh, what do the folks want to know out there? And I'm going to switch up my – I'm going to go uh, – I'm going to start playing some uh, some midwater worms just for just for the fun of it. Is that, is that okay with you, Shannon? Yeah, yeah, you're really going to test my <laughs> oh, <laughs> limits just, of knowledge. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just going to put worry. more, I'm just putting more worms up there just for fun, just, just to mix it up. Yeah, oh, but okay. We'll have more worms up on screen, but we still have lots of questions coming in about the worms that we've talked about so far, Shannon, um, especially those Ocidax worms. Um, folks are curious, what kind of pressure is it like down there where these worms are found? And do you find different species of Ocidax worms at different depths? Wow, these are all such good questions. Okay, so the pressure is intense. So for every 10 meters of water, it's an atmosphere of pressure. So everybody swim down to the bottom of the swimming pool and hopefully come right back up and you feel your ears hurt. And so imagine tens of thousands of swimming pools on your head. Now these worms, they don't mind the pressure so much because they don't really have any air spaces inside of them. And so, um, but I mean, we have Ocidax, they found Ocidax um, living on a whale off the coast of Brazil in 4,000 meters of water. Um, as far as the different species goes, um, we have lots of different species. And so we sunk whales everywhere from about 400 meters down to 1,800 meters. The first worms we found, most of the video that you guys are seeing are from a whale that we opportunistically found in 3,000 meters of water. And so that's a huge depth range. 
um, and we found different species at almost all the different depths. So um, that's why we have so many different species that we've discovered in the Monterey Bay is because we've looked at so many different depths of worms. Um, yeah, they're pretty cool. Awesome. awesome. Cool. Um, Shannon, we also have a question that's a, it's a bit of a which came first, the chicken or the egg situation here. Um, folks are curious, you know, vertebrates have been around for a relatively short period of time, especially compared to worms. So when did this bone eating worm really come around? Did, was it a worm, a different kind of worm that ate something else before then? What did they eat before then? When did these bone eating worms start eating bones? Another really good question. Okay, so we can <laughs> use the worms, or we did use the worms DNA to try to estimate how ancient these worms are. Because right, um, whales have been around for about 30 million years. Um, and so we did a little science experiment. So we, oh, well, first of all, back up. We used their DNA and um, there's a couple of different ways to do this, and you can use fossils, which is the better way, or, and obviously we didn't have any fossils of these worms, they're smushy, and they eat their environment that they would might maybe be fossilized in, um, so we couldn't do that, um, so we, uh, but you can use um, an estimate, so it's like a guess, a shot in the dark, it's hand wavy, <laughs> it's barely science, <laughs> um, <laughs> but we like it, it's fun. Um, and it's fun to daydream about how old these things really are. And so one of my estimates put them about the time of the origin of whales, which totally makes sense. It's satisfying, they eat whales. But um, when I used a different guess, which is for deep sea worms, um, this guess put them much older, maybe around 60 million years old. And that felt a little weird because there was the huge anoxic event in the ocean where not only were there um, no, no whales, but there was also not really any big things to eat, right? There were everything after the um, dinosaurs died and there was like nothing big. So we did a little science experiment where we put out all different kinds of bones and we put out turtle bones, which we know are ancient animals and have lived for millions of years. Um, we put out fish bones, we put out um, turkey bones. We actually put out a turkey. We have pictures of a turkey in the bottom of the ocean, which is pretty funny. Um, <laughs> cow bones, pig bones, any bones that I could get my hands on, we put into the bottom of the ocean all the way up until we, um, collaborators of mine are also have put out shark cartilage, um, and alligators. So it turns out that the Ossidax are able to colonize all of these different kinds of bones and even teeth in shark. So um, our, our, our older guess is probably more right. It's still hand, error bars are massive, um, but it looks like these, an these animals are capable of eating just about anything that has some sort of bone matrix. All right. Very cool. Well, that's exciting. That's so many, so many different options there. Everybody's back up on screen now, just very quickly to switch everything up. So bone eating worms, potentially eating any type of bone um that's put out there fascinating i didn't know that about the shark teeth or anything i've got currently up on screen by the way uh shannon some pigtail bone eating worms and undescribed species that's currently uh what the video is there do you do you have any facts about that it's actually described we did a oh, cool. um, quick we did a turbo taxonomy paper where we took a bunch of our different species that needed names because we were calling them Ossidax nude palp A, Ossidax nude palp B, <laughs> which was getting a little confusing for everybody. So um, the pigtailed ones are some of my favorite. They're so cool. So these guys don't, these girls, excuse me, don't actually live up properly on the whalebone. They live down in the mud and they do have the root system. I don't even know if I told you guys, the root system of the worms, of the Ossidax worms are where their symbiotic bacteria live. And the roots are almost, it's like a plant's roots, right? They go down in and that's how they extract the collagen from the bones to feed the bacteria. Um, so Ossidax Jabba is the one. Doesn't it look like Jabba the Hutt? Nice. <laughs> I see it now. <laughs> yeah. And actually Jabba was based on an annelid, 
It was not a very nice annelid. It was a male, <laughs> which we kind of missed the mark a little bit on that name, but I thought it looked like Job of the Hutt. Um, but I also thought it would get people excited about worms, but we got very little city on that one. Um, but the um, Ossidax Jabba has these long parchment-like filaments that go down deep into the mud and extract um, like minerals out or the, the nutrients out of like fragments of bone that have been like buried in the mud. Uh, and we've barely identified the symbionts that um, are associated with Ossidax Jabba. So that one's kind of a bit more of a head scratcher how that one occurs and how that one is living and producing such a big body with um, so few nutrients that we can tell that it's getting. So you could, are you saying that um, Osadax Java is, you're trying to figure out what kind of salacious crumbs it's able to get of, uh, of food out there. I think that's a proper Star Wars pun. I think it's a proper Star Wars pun. Emily, <laughs> right? Salacious crumb, Jabba the Hut. I'll give you half credit. Half credit, okay, I appreciate that everybody. Uh, thanks, thanks, thanks for playing uh, along with that. In our in our pass fail class, I'll I'll let you get a pass. Okay, thank you, Emily. You're back up on screen. Speaking of which, uh, what are the folks uh, wanting to know back at home? Um, well, Patrick, I don't know if you can uh, hop back to some of those hydrothermal vent communities. Yes, that we have videos of. Uh, but Shannon, folks are curious about how those worms have adapted to surviving in such extreme conditions around those hydrothermal vents and what part of the ecosystem do they play in that community? That's a great question. I don't know. We don't know. So um, one thing when, when um, researchers first found hydrothermal vents back in the 1970s, like they're relatively new scientifically, right? Um, we didn't even know they existed until they found them down in the Galapagos, off the Galapagos Islands. Um, they kind of, the idea was that we think basically life originated in this sort of reducing environment. Um, and so all the taxa um, that lived there, these giant clams and huge worms and all these really interesting things, they saw, they thought that they were like living fossils on the bottom of the ocean and that these meat animals were like a, a relic into the past. And it turns out most of these animals are recent radiations into the deep sea. So they're just really highly evolved to live there. We don't know how they've done it. It's, they just, that's, yeah, that's a good question. We don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. That's a great answer. I mean, there are still so many things that we don't know about the, the ocean in general, especially about the deep sea. So I don't know is perfectly okay to be saying for a lot of these questions that we're getting right now. Um, we did have another question about how climate change might be affecting these worms, especially the ones down in the hydrothermal vent communities. Well, I thought that our vent creatures were going to be like the poster child rock stars of climate change because the ocean is getting more acidic and it is getting warmer. And so I'm like, perfect, bring it. We got all these hydrothermal vent animals. They live in super low pH, which is really, really acidic. Like, um, in fact, some of the snails that live around vents barely make shells because it's so acidic um, and it's so hot, you know, whatever they can take a few degrees Celsius um, temperature increase, no problem, bring it. Um, but the minute that the oxygen levels drop, it kills everything. Um, and so the other thing, uh, the other confounding problem with climate change in the ocean is that the oxygen minimum zone is expanding and getting bigger. And so um, all these animals, while they are super, super tough, in fact, I've named some snails after Josh and the Clash because they're so hardcore and punk rock. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, even they cannot live without oxygen. So that's so good. Well, Shannon, that actually ties into another question that we got um, specifically relating to your Twitter handle. Folks are curious about why it's at punk rock snails. <laughs> <laughs> that's why. Yeah. Um, when I used to talk to kids and tell kids about, um, about these snails, you know, these are snails from the Western Pacific, from the genus Alvinaconca, and we've known for a long time that they were all, um, that there were lots of different lineages. And so we went ahead and named them based on their DNA. 
Um, and since I didn't have any morphological characters to name them after, I got to name them after a couple of different scientists. And then of course, Joe Strummer from The Clash, because when I would talk to kids, they live right around the chimneys of hydrothermal vents, which is the hottest, lowest pH, gnarliest environment you could possibly live in as an animal or anything. Um, and so, you know, and they've got spikes all over their shells and they look really cool. They're big and um, they have purple blood. So, you know, they, it kind of fit. Dang. That's, I love it. that's the best backstory to a Twitter handle I think I've ever heard. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, we have another question here. Are bone eating, or can we find bone eating worms on land? Huh? Yeah, no, none that I know of. So these guys are definitely living in the ocean, salt water, but um, off the coast of Sweden, they threw some bones off a jetty in like 10 meters of water, 20 meters of water, really shallow scuba diving depths. And they got colonization of Ossidax there. So I mean, that's as close to land as you can get, I think. There you go. That works. Wow. Um, another question uh, here coming in from Twitch. Uh, do worms sleep? Oh. I don't think so. <laughs> they quiver in fear when we show up. <laughs> we always make jokes about the ROV showing up and the, like, the, the aliens coming to abduct their friends and then you know, they, they never bring, we don't bring, we don't put them back because that would just make, they, it would be embarrassing for them because they would have these stories about being abducted by aliens and then they get back and then. <laughs> <laughs> so that de definitely something, uh, yeah, definitely something to keep in mind with a lot of the deep sea research that, that is being done, uh, around the world is that all of those alien abduction stories is kind of what you end up doing, needing to do to understand what's going on, because not only can people not live down there, but these animals also, um, it's, it's hard to even spend a lot of time with them to figure out what they're doing. Right. So you've been describing, uh, how you're discovering all these brand new species and everything, but then their ecological role um, is still very, mu uh, very much a mystery. Uh, where would you say we are in terms of understanding the role of worms in, in, in the deep sea? It's still a vast open frontier, right? Uh, there's still so much more to find out. We're just at the species level of identification for, for many things, right? Oh, absolutely. I mean, we barely have scratched the surface. We don't even know all of the worms that are out there. I mean, um, <laughs> Every time we would go to sea, we would find new species and I would run down the hall and tell my boss, we found another one. And he'd be like, go away. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of work to describe species. And um, so yeah, ecologically, we barely, barely have a handle on I, even who's there, let alone what they're doing and how they're affecting the environment and how they fit into the mosaic of all the different species and what they're doing. Gotcha, okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, do you have any worm requests for me to play video here, Shannon, while, while, while we're going, while we wait for another question from, from Emily, do you have any worm requests from what I might have to play here? Anything, <laughs> anything we haven't talked about yet? Oh, you know, Tomopterus are always cool. Okay. Tomopterus coming right up. Here it is. It's on screen. You're up there with the Tomopterus worm. So I just like these worms. Um, so these are midwater worms and they are swimming their entire lives. And so um, one of my earlier cruises in, in and when we go out to sea, we call it cruises. We're not like on a cruise cruise, we're, we're cruise. Um, but one of my earlier cruises, I got to see this mama Tomopterus holding up all her babies. She was swimming around her babies and swimming around her babies, basically holding all her babies together so that they could grow up big enough to, um, to, to be successful little Tomopterus worms. And, Wow. They're bioluminescent. They're really cool. They're just really cool worms. Wow. Yeah. And uh, that bioluminescence that you mentioned, we've talked about it on a few of these, but I'm playing that bio that yellow bioluminescence there behind you now, Shannon, with the Tomopterus worm. It's very cool. And yeah, I, I, my, the lab I work in now studies the evolution of bioluminescence with Steve Haddock. And so um, it's not my section of getting to work on, but I get to like look over their shoulders while they're getting different animals to bioluminesce. And it is really cool. And uh, I'm going to call out uh, George Matsumoto here, who's on the call with us just super quick because uh, you can wave hi. Uh, George, you've got a Tomopterus worm there behind you as your Zoom background. So good job, George. You got you got a big fan there of worms there on, on the call with us uh, there, Shannon. <laughs> 
that was that was my way to get George up on up on screen. Yeah, there. We're, we're back to words. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. And then the good one is pig butt. Pig butt worm. Okay. Coming right up. Let's do it. Uh, oh, we have it labeled as gumball worm. K topdress, right? Yes. Okay. There it is. <laughs> up on screen. Pig butt worm. So pig butt worm is super cool. We didn't even know what phylum pig butt was in when they first found it. Um, it's a, it's a cutopterus. It's just another kind of worm. They're really neat, but it looks like a pig's butt. And, um, Karen Osborne who described it, um, I, I, I ruined the Latin name, which nobody would understand it anyways, if I said it, cause I'll say it wrong, but in Latin, she gave it, a, it says pig butt. It's, uh, <laughs> and it's one thing we don't ever tell people is what we really call things when we first find them because we're trying to be professional um but when we first found the osidax worm we called them green snot worms because it looked like a bunch of green snot with a worm coming out of it and then when karen first saw pig butt she called it pig butt so science is actually fun so uh correct me if i'm wrong it would be catoptris puga porcinus is that the is that what it was yeah, Puga porcinus. Puga porcinus. But you're probably saying it right. I oh, my no. pronunciation's not good. No, we <laughs> just stick with pig butt, everybody. We started off the stream today talking about worms without butts, and we've come full circle all the way around to a worm that looks like a pig is a pig's haunch. Um, I believe I believe if if we can't make worms interesting with with that type of uh, that type of interpretation, Shannon, I, I'm not quite sure what to try. <laughs> I think we did it. Uh, Emily, let's go to you for some questions here. We've been streaming coming up on uh, just about an hour. So I don't know if it's uh, time for our rapid fire uh, questions here with, with Shannon, but uh, you're back up on screen there. Emily, what do the folks want to know? Okay. I apologize for the squeaking in the background. <laughs> That's Trooper playing with her squeaky toy right next to me. <laughs> Wait, hold so. on. Hold on, we've got we've got the solution to that. I think uh, uh, let's get the let's get the Trooper. Uh, Let's get the trooper bug here up on up on screen here. One one second here. I think I have it somewhere. Yes, there's trooper. Let's Got her nose on the screen, although the background. No, there you go. There's there's trooper. <laughs> the trooper logo right there next to you there, Emily. It's booyah. <laughs> we nailed it. Okay, right. what do the folks want to know at home? Okay, so uh, we did have a question here. Um, are there related species of worms that live both on the sea floor and in the midwater? Oh, that's a good question. I have to think about that for a second. Well, yeah, well, they're pretty different actually. When you, you're really adapted to really great motility when you're living in the midwater versus the sea floor. Yeah, no, they're, they're really different. Really None different. that I can think of. Yeah, I can't think of anything that. Well, there you stumped. go. Yeah, way to <laughs> way to stump the worm scientist. And by the way, this this just go. this just means everybody that uh, um, if you're finding these questions um, or if you have those questions that are difficult for us to answer, just know that that's your PhD, that's your uh, postdoc, <laughs> that's your lab that you can set up there uh, at home, everybody. So if you're coming up with these questions and you're like, oh man. I didn't get a satisfying answer to that. Um, then we we need you on board. Uh, come on down and start uh, learning that deep sea science because uh, that deep sea with this um, this worm next to me, Tomopterus, uh, there's just so much life out there that we have yet to even understand. And uh, folks like Shannon are working so hard to just even find names for these animals. Uh, and then there's so much more work to be done on top of on top of that to understand what these animals are doing. I'm just going to put the pig butt worm back up on screen and I'll go back over to Emily now. Look at this high production value. Uh, Emily, maybe rapid fire for, for Shannon here. What do we think? All right. Um, well, I don't know if this one's too much of a rapid fire. I don't think okay. that we have videos of them, uh, but folks were curious about ship worms uh, that they oh. might have heard of before. Can you tell us a little bit about ship worms? Oh, ship worms are the coolest. They're actually mollusks, you know. We get a lot of confusion. Sometimes we can't figure out what phylum a thing is, and then we'll call it a worm. I'm sure you guys all heard about penis fish yes. this year. <laughs> the fat <laughs> innkeeper worm, fish. yes. Yes, yeah. the eurekas. They're <laughs> weenie worms. Why can't we say weenie worms? But anyways, 
Um, so shipworms are mollusks and they eat wood. And so they use symbiotic bacteria in their guts to break down the wood because, you know, wood doesn't taste that good. Um, they're really neat. They're really amazing animals. I don't have any of those, but I'm going to put string bean <laughs> clams up on, on screen just because we have, uh, we have some mollusks there that are chemosynthetic, tangentially related, not shipworms. These are not shipworms, everybody, but got some, <laughs> got some string bean clams there. The video of shipworms would not be the most riveting. Okay. <laughs> it would be they like a be... hole in a wood. <laughs> nice. There you go. So folks just go like head over to uh, head over to a piece of wood. Imagine a hole is there and then that's your shipworm simulation for at home. Nice. Okay. Uh, Emily, back to you. All right. Um, uh, I guess this is a little bit of a rapid fire question. Shannon, do you have any favorite worms? Well, I did get to name one of the Ocidax species after my son. So there's an Whoa. Ocidax fried rye. So that's pretty awesome. And I, I have a name, one, one named after me and I can't remember the genus name. <laughs> that's so bad. Oh no. Yep, something Shannon A is out there. <laughs> so I have to love that worm. But okay, my favorite is probably Elvis. So they just described four new species of these worms that we call Elvis. And it turns out, it's funny because we'll go out to see and we're like, no, that's Elvis, no, that's Elvis, no, that's Elvis. Elvis is a scale worm and it has these amazing iridescent scales on its back. And as soon as you collect it, all the scales fall off. But it looks like your mom's fingernails from the 80s when they're like all iridescent, opalescent rad. Whoa. They're super cool. And then they swim. They're polychaetes, and so they're like the Tomopterus. You know, they do that undulating swimming coolness, but um, they, they're more benthic. They, they live on the bottom. But when you um, disturb whatever environment they're crawling around on, they go swimming away, and then they usually have um, like pyrite in their kitty, and so which are their little bristles on the sides of their bodies. And so they have like, these golden spikes coming off the side of their bodies that they swim with. And they just have this amazing swimming behavior that's really cool. And they named two of the species. Well, one of the species is named after Elvis. So there's, I can't, Penelopolinoli Elvisae or something. And But then they named two after two of my favorite collaborators, Shanika Freddy and Victoria Orphan, who are both professors in at Caltech and at um, Occidental College. <clears throat> so Elvis, Elvis has to be one of my favorite worms. That's awesome. And behind you right now, I have the midwater polychaete flota. So this is, or flotta, this is not Elvis, but it is a similar type of polychaete. You can see those bristles there, shimmering bristles uh, there in, in the background, but not, that is not the one that you were mentioning, Shannon. It just is background is visual filler. Right. But flota is cool too. Flota, I believe, makes bioluminescence. We don't know if Elvis does or not. I don't think anybody has looked. Oh, all right. Well, I, it, hope, uh, if it is um, if it is a blue bioluminescence, would you call that blue suede goose or whatever would end up being? That's my. Well, we will now. That's we my that's will. my submission. Okay, yeah. <laughs> humbly, humbly proposed. Okay, back to you, Emily. <laughs> All right. Um, well, Patrick, I, I do want to be mindful of yes. the time here. Um, so this might be a great question to, to end our, our stream with folks, um, especially young folks are, are tuning in right now, watching and learning all about these worms. Um, Shannon, we had a couple of people curious about how you got into the wonderful world of worms. And do you have any advice for any young children out there or even older children out there too, uh, who would like to get into uh, marine biology and especially deep sea marine biology? I mean, yeah, I am so lucky to have this job and I have really stumbled here. I just kind of kept doing what I liked and it turned out in undergrad, I um, volunteered in a genetics lab. I was really enamored with a little tube of DNA and I was um, started, we started um, playing with worms and spawning them and growing up their larvae. And I, I didn't even know what a polychaete was at that point. And so that was really interesting to me and really fun to me. And so I just kind of kept at doing things that were interesting and fun to me. And then I um, ended up going to graduate school at Moss Landing Marine Labs and playing with more lower invertebrates and their DNA. And so I probably 
gotten to keep my job because um, I won't quit. <laughs> they won't. <laughs> they fired me, and I won't leave. Um, <laughs> but uh, no. Um, but because I really like to write code, and I do a lot of work with R, and um, and uh, uh, do genetics. And so I'm not necessarily a classic marine scientist, which is why I have a lot of I don't know question answers. <laughs> But um, just keep doing what you like and what's fun for you, and then you will find your way. Well, that's awesome. Uh, I'm going to put all of us back up on screen here as sort of a concluding uh, slide. Thank you so much, uh, Shannon. Oh, Shan Shannon's right down here. Oh, Emily's over here. Okay, awesome. Thank right. you so much, Shannon. That was that was awesome. Uh, uh, thank you so much for all of that that worm knowledge all around us here. Uh, we've got Susan, we've got George, we've got Cassie, uh, amazing folk over there at the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute. Those are the folks that have been typing away furiously, answering your questions there live uh, during the stream. Uh, great job, Emily. We've got true. Oh, we've got trooper sighting. Yeah, we got trooper, trooper sighting, nice. everybody. Yeah. Yeah, the social media pup has decided to make an appearance. Nice. We got we got Trooper. Hi, Trooper. Did you like the worm talk? Yes. She uh, did. That was awesome. Uh, thank you, Shannon, for your expertise on, on worms. Any parting thoughts for the folks out there? Worms are cool. All right. <laughs> there you go. That's perfect. Well, thank you so that's much. All they need. <laughs> that's all. That's all they need to know. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in, for joining us here uh, today for the Monterey Bay Aquarium and Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute Mysteries of the Deep, Weird and Wonderful Worms with Shannon Johnson. Uh, you can watch more of these over on our YouTube channel, Facebook, uh, Twitch, Twitter. It's all out there, and we will see you again soon in the, the deep sea. Thanks, everyone. Bye for now. Thanks.